Okay, we're going to do a piece now. This is part of a new liturgy that's going to be coming your way uh, towards the end of September, so you still got a couple of months. We've been going through some of these songs periodically to give you a little familiarization with them. And this is, it's, uh, the liturgy is called Now the Feast and Celebration. And this is the Kyrie portion of that.
more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us your abundant mercy. Forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience. And give us those good things that come only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it on the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, it's just not part of our culture to um, 
organize ourselves in the same way that, that, that Jesus society did. Um, but there's lots of societies in the world that are much more formal than ours, that use uh, more formal language, uh, offer different points of deference. So, for example, um, I did a year of my graduate school and seminary in Germany. I got a scholarship to, to go to Germany. And Germany has a lot of uh, this European formality still in its culture. When I was in class, we would call our professor, well, in, in Germany, to begin with, um, whatever degrees you have earned, you will be addressed by. All of them. So I would have to call my professor, for example, Herr, Mr., Doctor, but he had two doctors, so he's Herr, Doctor, Doctor, Pfarrer, Pastor, Schmidt. I have to say, uh, I have a point, Mr. Dr. Dr. Pastor Schmidt. And you have to do that every single time. Like, that was important to use people's titles. But even amongst my friends, these are my friends that we would hang out and, you know, go, we, it was Germany, so we had a bar on campus naturally. And we'd go hang out for a beer after class. We would use each other's first names, but in the classroom setting, we would call each other, you know, I've talked to my friend as Herr Schwarze, and he'd call me Herr Morris. Or I'd say, you know, Frau Schinkenbach. In class, we would have to call each other Mr. and, and Miss. And so that, that was just baked into German culture. It's very formal. Um, it, it kind of really came to light for me uh, because in Germany, when you answer the phone, you don't say hello. You actually identify yourself by your last name. So you pick up the phone, and I'd pick up the phone, and I'd say, Morris. That's the first thing I said. So they would know which person had picked up the phone. Now, I didn't know this. Uh, at first, when I moved to Germany, so uh, in, in the prep time, the year before I went, I was corresponding a lot with the international student coordinator, and his name is Marcus. And because he understood that America is not a formal country, he would call me Ben, and I would call him Marcus. And he'd sign his emails, Marcus. And but, but when I started calling him, I didn't know Germans used your last name. So he'd pick up the phone and he'd say, Mülke, because his last name is Mülke. But I didn't know that. And in different parts of Germany, they have different customs for how they say hello. When I went to the north for my language class, uh, they would all say moin to say hello. So you walk into a bakery and go moin moin, and then say moin moin, and somebody else say moin moin. It sounded like frogs were moin moin, moin moin, moin moin, moin moin. And and so that was, that was how in Bremen, very specific to Bremen and Hamburg, that's how you say hello. If you go down to the Alps in Bavaria, you say hello by saying Grüß Gott, uh, or you say Servus, if they're your friend. And so Marcus, I'd call him up just to make sure everything was okay, he'd pick up the phone and he'd say, Mülke, and in my mind, this is Franconian, that's the part of Germany I'm going to move to. I thought this was Franconian for hello. <laughs> but I wanted to be formal and use the proper etiquette, so he'd pick up and go, Mülke, and I'd say, Mülke, and go, yeah, Mülke. Like, I would, he'd, so he'd say, this is Mülke, and I'd say his last name, he'd say, yes, this is me. So I just assumed we were all saying hello. So I moved to my town, and Marcus is waiting for me at the train station. So I get off the train station, there's this big, tall, happy man waving, and I realize that's, that's Marcus. So I go, Mülke, because I think that's hello. And, but he is Marcus Mooka. He goes, yeah, Mooka. I'm like, okay, so then I'm walking around campus and I see people. I'm like, Mooka, Mooka. And my classmates, it's a small school, they all, they put it together. This guy thinks Mooka is hello. So they all start saying it. So then I'm like walking around town. I'm going to like Nuremberg and Munich saying Mooka to people. And, and like the whole campus, the professors, the administration, the groundskeepers, the, the, the cooks in the kitchen, they're all in on this massive joke. And then by mid-October, when the rest of campus comes in after language classes are over, I'm still walking around saying, Mooka, and my friend Pedro, I just met, goes, why the heck are you saying Marcus's last name to everybody? And I was like, what? <laughs> and all my friends, we were all at the table, like, oh, they all started dying laughing. So they kept up this massive elaborate joke for a month. But it was, it was all made possible because I did not understand the rules of formality in this culture. 
I did, you know, I mean, things that we all take for granted, how you answer the phone, how you refer to people in your life. These are things you just intuit in your own culture, and every culture does them differently, and so did the culture of Jesus' time. Now, we live in a culture where, we are, we, where, where our primary motivation in how we deal with problems is, is we deal with social problems through a process we all know, it's called guilt. Right? And guilt is when you make a mistake, you now have guilt. And you have to figure out, what am I going to do with guilt? And guilt is actually, it's not an unhealthy emotion to have. If you've done something wrong, you probably should feel some level of guilt. And guilt is extremely different from shame. And the difference is guilt is saying, I made a mistake. Shame is saying, I am a mistake. And in cultures that use honor and shame, not only is shame a really detrimental construct, it's also contagious. So if you make a big enough mistake, it's not just that you have shame, your family now has shame. And what the, everybody's desire is to have honor. And the way to know you have honor is you have to know your place in society. Right? At the high part of the society are the Romans. They've taken over. They run everything. You give the Romans all the deference in the world because they have swords and you don't. And then you've got, in the religious system, you've got priests, and under the priests you have Levites, and then there's rabbis in the synagogues, and they get all this deference. And then most people live lives as peasants. They have no honor, and they're at the bottom of the ladder. And this is precisely the group of people that Jesus is gathering around him and teaching. He's their rabbi. Rabbis aren't supposed to pick peasants. But this rabbi does. He gets fishermen and prostitutes and tax collectors. People who have no honor. People whose lives are lives of shame. Now the highest of this construct is of course who has the most honor? God. And so when you approach God, you approach God as somebody with lots of shame, and you approach God as God the ultimate in honor. And this lives its life out in the Jewish tradition in some really fascinating and beautiful and deep ways. For example, when God gives God's name to Moses in the book of Exodus, right? There's four letters to the name of God. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And when Jews are reading in the synagogue to this day, when they come to that sacred name of God, they don't say it. You cannot speak God's sacred name. And so they insert the word Adonai, which in their language is Lord. So you read the four letters, you don't say them, you say Adonai. So whenever, when you look at your Bible and you see Lord in all uppercase like that, you know what I'm talking about? That's actually where the sacred name of God is written in the original. And when they're writing it, when they're making a Torah, Torahs are always handwritten. The, the, the rabbi who's writing the Torah will get to the name of God, where he's supposed to describe it, and he'll take a new quill, dip it in the ink, write those four letters, and immediately burn that quill. It can only ever be used once if you're using the sacred name of God. That's the social customs going on. And so Jesus... He's got these disciples, and they're people without honor, and they come to him and they say, Lord, teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples to pray. And then Jesus opens it up by saying, when you pray, pray like this. Father. Now take what Jesus just told us to address God with, and think about it in the construct of that society. God is the ultimate, almighty creator of the universe. We can't even say God's name because our lips are too shameful and unclean. And now, we're told to talk about God in the most intimate and familiar of ways. Dad. How many of you have ever nagged your dad? How many of you are dads who've been nagged? How many of you have nagged your moms? How many more moms have been nagged? I think about all of Dad, I need car keys. Dad, I have 20 bucks in my to today. Dad, I don't want to do my homework. Right? I mean, we've all been there or heard it. 
And now I'm, I'm 38 years old. Dad, I don't understand how this mortgage works. Dad, now that I've got kids who are growing up, Dad, I, I don't know how to be a dad. You know, my kid is now, uh, my oldest is, is six, and, and it's time to start getting her into like organized activities. Like, I literally call my dad like, so it's like, Dad, how much is too much money to be spending on these kids' activities, right? Because kids' activities are expensive. You know, like, what was the rule you set for, for Nick and I? So, so like, when we, when we approach our parents, or when our kids approach us, there's a level of familiarity you don't give to other people, right? And then we all know the truth. If you have siblings, think about how you talk about your mom and dad with your sibling. My brother called and goes, Mom stopped by today. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Did she rearrange her cupboard? Because that's what she does when she comes by our house. Right? So, like, like, this is how we respond. This is how Jesus is telling us to address the God whose name is so holy you're not allowed to say it. Think about that for a minute. Think about what that means. Think about the way you approach your parents when you need help or advice or just someone to be with. And that's how Jesus begins the Lord's Prayer. So everything after that is you're not approaching the almighty creator of the universe because you were so shameful and you're just begging for a, you know, a, a scrap at God's table. You're approaching God as a loving parent. It changes everything else he says below. And then if the loving parent metaphor doesn't work for you, God gives, I mean, Jesus gives you another way to, to think about it. God is the neighbor that you get to annoy. I've got some company, can I have some bread? No, go home. Not good enough, I need bread, get up. Get up, I need bread. Fine. Think about that. Think about like how radical this story is, not just for his culture. How radical this story is today. God is the neighbor you get to annoy. And you only get a few of those in your life, right? I mean, for those of us who move around a lot, that's one of the hard things is you get to a new town, it takes about a good 10 years to get a neighbor you can do that to, and then if you leave, it's a hard cycle. I mean, some of us only get those type of friendships and neighborly relationships once or twice in our life, and Jesus is saying, this is your God. God is your beloved parent. God is the neighbor you get to annoy for what you need. And that last part of that parable when it says, because of your persistence, that's only one possible translation of the Greek. The other way to think about it is, is shamelessness. There are people in your life who don't have to worry about guilt or shame. You're bound to each other, and that's just how it is. And that is your God. The last thing I want to say before uh, I end this almost Baptist-length sermon is this. When we read the Lord's Prayer later, when we sing old-fashioned hymns, we encounter words that we think are words of respect. Thee and thou, right? We just sang the sweet hour of prayer. We talk about God as thee and thou. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And in our culture right now, we think that that means those are words of respect. And they're actually not. English, like German or Spanish or French, used to have two cases. Formal and informal. In English, the informal is the and that. The formal case is you. English did something weird in the 1700s. We dropped the informal case. And because we dropped it, we kept it in certain places. We kept it in the language of faith and prayers and hymns. And because we think of God as so high up, we think that thee and thou must be the terms of respect. But they're absolutely not. That's why when you read Romeo and Juliet, they call each other thee and thou. Two teenagers in love don't use respectful terms for each other. That wouldn't make any sense. You don't offer your heart to, 
to somebody way above you like that. You offer your heart to the people that you are on the same level with and you love deeply. That's why Shakespeare's poetry is always covered in these and thous. It was the language of deep and abiding friendship and love. And so when we say the Lord's Prayer and we get to the these and thous, remember that's not the way to address God formally. That's the way to address God as your friend, as your parent, as the neighbor you get to bug. That's your God. So when you pray, pray in that way, because that's the way Jesus taught us. Amen.
and those who are weary from illness, give us today our daily bread. Lord, in your mercy.
Keep doing that. They need support too. If, if your heart is for Lutheran World Relief or Lutheran Disaster Response or the Red Cross, if you're giving in a place that makes a difference in a hurting world, I don't want you to stop giving to that to give to campus ministry. But if you feel called to support a ministry that shows up in the lives of college students with the gospel of Jesus Christ, let's have a conversation after service. I'd love to do it. And now we'll take up our general offering.
All are welcome at Christ's table this morning. Please be seated and follow the directions of your ushers.
and keep you in his grace. Amen. O God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. May the cares of this life strengthen us to love you with all our heart, serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Live your lives rooted in Christ. Live your lives in Christ rooted and built up in Him. And abound in thanksgiving and the blessings of Holy Trinity, one God, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Please be seated for announcements. I don't know what happens in your church, but do you have any announcements? That was a short time to be seated. <laughs> Let's rise. Get those aerobics in. And we'll sing our sending song.
Sí.